Hey, good morning, folks. If you're Folks, looks like we have about 14. Good morning. Good morning. Let's see who we have on. Man, I don't have a really great signal here. So uh, plug in your router and Wi-Fi is unstable. So hopefully that's not going to stop. Looks like we have 26 people on. Wi-Fi is not showing off very good. If you're wondering what that beeping sound in the background is, uh, we'll wait till the Wi-Fi stabilizes. I'm not sure what's going on here. Let me click on that button and see what happens. Boom. I click on that. Try to move it closer to a router. Why would I move closer to a router? Hey, good morning. Can you hear me and see me okay? Sorry, I'm going to stop that beeping for a second, and I'll tell you what it is. Good morning. Good morning. IDPA is on. We have 34 live viewers right now. This is actually pretty impressive. Hopefully, you can hear me and see me okay. I'm not sure what my video stream looks like, but I'm going to try to address that in a second. If I need to, I'll start the broadcast again. Uh, I don't have a really great or very strong Wi-Fi signal. So someone give me a uh, thumbs up if we are looking good and sounding good this morning. I know I, I look good, but if my video stream looks good and it's not real pixelated, then I'll show you what I was using to dry fire with here in a second. And uh, we have 40 people on already. That is actually quite impressive. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hmm. Daniel James is on. Rudy, good morning. Georgie is on. Good morning. Loud and clear. Joey says loud and clear from Mr. Joe Rooster. All right. Hey, folks. Um, today we're talking about uh, low light, but if you jumped on when I was doing just a little bit of dry fire, you might have seen this. This is the RPT, Repetitive Part Timer, on the Live Fire app. So if you can see what's going on here, I have it actually set for three seconds uh, on my start delay, right? Uh, I have a five... Uh, second reset time and then this tells you the repetitions that i've done right so when i talk when you see me on instagram or um if i log my score and post it on instagram this is what i'm talking about this is what i'm using to get my 50. so if to, like for example today is low light so i would set up my rpt repetitive part timer this actually has um a part time of 3.5 seconds on it and then I would go through my 50 repetitions. And instead of having to sit there and reach out and hit your timer every time, like hit the beat button and then start over, this runs you through it. So you can adjust the amount of time. I'm going to stop it real quick. So, for example, um, let me do this. So you can adjust the part time um, and you can adjust the repetitions and you can adjust the reset time. So I'll, you know, right now I have it on 25, but normally I'll go, you know, I'll set 50 repetitions and then whatever reset time, that's gonna be dictated by what you're doing. Uh, just so I wanted to show you off this off. If the, by the way, this in, in the um, description of my Facebook Live, wake up Mike C. Cleaner. In my description of Facebook Live, the very first line says uh, 30 day trial. So the Live Fire guys, there's a 30 day free thing. So you can use the RPT for, th for 30 days. So just sign up for 30 days. If you don't like it, set a reminder to cancel it. So uh, it's pretty darn cool. But if you want to get your 50, if I'm talking about getting my 50 and I'm telling you to get your 50, that's what I'm talking about. So go to that first link. Uh, if you want to click on that now, and I'll give you a second to check that out or save that link or go to the description. It's the very first one. You can get 30 days free. Anyways, good morning, folks. My name is Mike Seaclanner. Um, we're going to get right into it this morning. Hopefully everybody's doing great. We're talking about low light. I actually have a table of low light gear out here. I have some flashlights. I have a bunch of flashlights. I have some handheld flashlights. I have a couple different variances. Uh, I have a, a larger, what I would call a home defense flashlight. I have one of my carry flashlights that I've been carrying for several years now since my buddy Andy sent me one of these uh, stilettos from Surefire. And I also have some weapon mounted lights. So I'm going to talk to you about low light solutions, specifically weapon mounted lights, the pros and cons of weapon mounted lights, handheld lights, how you might consider selecting a handheld light. We will talk about a little bit about the use of low light systems, like what, what, what does our low light system have to do? And, uh, and then we'll do some Q&A and have some fun. Um, and Brian, you're right. Yeah, it got, you got, it looks like Brian got the live fire. Uh, let's, let me give me some, let's do some good mornings. Who do we have on here? Joey Russo, good morning. Rudy, good morning, sir. David is in South Carolina, probably. Good morning. Good morning. IDPA is in the house. Daniel, good morning, sir. And that, is that Georgie? Georgia 
Kacharava. Georgi Kacharava. If that's if that's right, tell me that's right. Mm. James Trombley. Rudy saw him. Pat is on. Good morning, Pat. Number 2446. Very nice. Vincio is on. Daniel, I think I said good morning to you. By the way, the, the Wi-Fi signal should be much better now. Hopefully, it's strengthened. I don't know what's up with the Wi-Fi. Everything shut off in my house. It's baloney. We're supposed to have the fastest Wi-Fi they, they offer, and sometimes it pixelates. That's complete crap. Brian, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Scott is on. Good morning. Probably from Colorado. Montana is in the house. Number 800, Mr. Will. Patrick, good morning. How are you? Hey, Kip, I see you on River Bend Gun Club, IDP. Awesome. Clint, Diego. Anyways, uh, I think I've said good morning to everybody, folks. If you have a chance, click that share button. Tell people we're starting right now as I'm warming up and having a sip of my coffee. You do so as well. If you are watching this later on, it's funny. I, last week when I went live uh, on Thursday morning, I think it was Thursday morning. Anyways, I was live on Facebook and live on you, YouTube. Right now, I'm live on the IDPA Facebook page. Good morning, IDPA Facebook. How are you? Uh, I'm live on my shooting performance page and, of course, our American Warrior Society page. But last week, I also went live on the YouTube page. And uh, I don't know how many people watch on YouTube, but it was so funny. There was an a, a old veteran grunt to 2424. 24. I don't know, remember what his name is like. You know, good, great content, but can't stand all the comments. So I'm sorry if you're watching on YouTube later on or whatever else. And you don't like me commenting and saying hi to people and good morning. I'm sorry. Forgive me for saying good morning and, and hi. That's the point of a live stream, right? Why would we do a live stream if I couldn't say good morning to you and talk? Duh. That doesn't make any sense. That's stupid. I don't see a lot of stuff as stupid, but that's stupid. Sorry, man. Sorry I didn't will it down to 30.2 seconds of tips and you don't have the patience to watch for a moment while we say hello to everybody. So, all right, folks, let's get into it. Of course, before we do this, uh, safety is always uh, the number one thing. So please do me a favor if you're going to handle your firearms, and I do recommend you play around. Uh, we'll talk about the one-handed eye index technique briefly. By the way, to the technical aspect of this stuff, the technique stuff, I'm going to be moving till to the next Thursday. I will talk about it today, so please don't shut this off and say, oh, I don't want to hear about this. I want to wait for the technique. We're going to talk a little bit about technique today, and I'm going to talk a lot about technique next week. I'm going to talk about the eye index technique. I'm going to talk about the utility of potentially – the other low light techniques that were out there for many, many years, like the Harry's technique, you know, when you might utilize those, what my favorite technique is and stuff like that. And I'll give you a, a brief glimpse of that today, but I'm going to be covering a lot more of that next Thursday uh, when we go live next week. So tell people about it. Click the share button. Let them know. So if you're doing this stuff with me today, please first make sure there are no live weapons in your area. So let's go through a few guns here. I have my beautiful new and I just got this. Wilson Combat SFX9. I'll check that out. They should play some music. I know. And folks, if you're watching this and seeing guns like this, yes, I'm sponsored by Wilson Combat. Uh, so you're going to see Wilson Combat guns. Uh, this is one of my Wilson Combat Glock 19 slides on a Gen 4 lower. I've got a low light setup on this. I'm going to tell you, which, by the way, this is a prototype. This thing is not even out yet. I'll show you this uh, just a second. So that is unloaded and clear. I got a second Glock 19 with another Wilson Combat slide. And those of you that are coin members, just, I wanted to show you this, if you can see this in the light. Let me, there, there, there's a good light. Ooh, coin members should recognize that logo. They can, by the way, Wilson Combat could put our coin member logo on your slides. They could probably put your coin number on there as well. I'm guessing, don't, don't quote me. Uh, so then it's unloaded and cleared as well. And last but not least though, a big old Glock 22, old school, 40 caliber Glock 22 with the TLR 2G weapon mount of light. That guy is unloaded and clear as well. So we're going to talk about all those. So do me a favor if you're joining along with me and you're going to do this with me, please double check and make sure you are unloaded and clear. You have no live firearms and uh, make sure you comply and follow all safety rules. Like I said before, if you haven't shared this, do me a favor and share it in our training addicts group, the coin members group, the ACSS group. Uh, Glock Nation group, Black Rifle Coffee group, whatever groups you're a member of, please do me a favor and share, and we'll boost up. We'll see if we can hit 100 plus. So let's let's talk real quickly about low light solutions. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is selecting a handheld light, right? So when we talk about a handheld light, we're talking about a handheld light that you could utilize to search an area, uh, and maybe maybe I should rewind, uh, folks. If you're just jumping on, we have 70 viewers on. 
My name is Mike C. Kleiner. Welcome to uh, the live stream, Shooting Performance TV. We're talking about low light stuff. Well, let, let's let's define low light. When we're talking about low light, everybody thinks about low light in terms of, okay, I have a flashlight. I'm going to build a stable shooting position, and that's low light. But in reality, low light needs to offer a few things. Here's what your low light system needs to do for you. Number one, it needs to give you the ability to search the area, right? So your low light techniques needs to give you, your low light technique or technical system needs to give you the ability to search the area. So number one, your low light system has to give you the ability to search. Number two, your low light system has to give you the ability to defend your head and fight, right? So whether or not I have the gun out yet, if I am searching and all of a sudden a guy jumps out of the closet or doorway and I can't defend my head against something he's swinging at me or maybe a fist, right? Okay. And I can't maybe throw a counter strike. To me, that's a failure of the low light system. So number two, the low light system has to give you the ability to defend your head, right? With what we call a cage or a half cage type position as well as strike. So for me, you'll see a lot of my low light work and technical stuff is with one uh, flashlight in one hand. So it's got to give you the ability to search. It's got to give you the ability to defend your head and fight. And then, of course, last but not least, it has to give you the ability to shoot. So your low light system has to give you the ability to illuminate the sighting system on your handgun and shoot with it, right? Now, this particular technique is what I call the, the one-handed eye index technique. Some folks call this you know, they used to call it the cheek index or the neck index, but I found that a cheek index or a neck index is too low. We'll talk about that later on. So that's what your low light system has to give you the ability to do, to search an area, to fight, right, to throw a strike with your flashlight or defend your head, and then, of course, to shoot, to build a shooting position, whether it's, you know, a one-handed shooting position or a two-handed shooting position where you might stabilize the gun. And there are some pros and cons behind a two-handed stabilized position. You know, there's some reasons I might do this, and there are a lot of reasons I wouldn't do this. Because in this particular case, if we're talking about low-light principles, think about this for a second. If I'm searching and my hands are tied together and someone jumps out of that closet, literally at contact distance, for me to, to fight with the light, man, I've, I've got to cross my arm and the muzzle up, right, just to throw a strike. And you may say, well, Mike, why, why not shoot? Well, what if I can't shoot right away? What if I can't identify where my family members are? What if I don't know where, you know, my daughter popped? Is she on the ground next to me? Is she, is she close? I, maybe I can't shoot, right? I can't defend my head from this position either, right? Someone throws a strike before I see it coming. I can't defend my head. Where if I have the flashlight in the right position, boom, I could cage up and at least cover my head from some sort of strike. Uh, so that's important to me as well. Okay. Now, in terms of that, um, this is a oh, I'm dropping flashlights over here. This is a uh, technical aspect of selecting a light system. Like, so when I look at a one-handed technique, oh, sorry, folks, my flashlights are rolling off my table here. So I'm, when we're talking about selecting a handheld light, uh, there's a few things that it has to offer for you. Okay. Number one, it has to offer enough lumens or brightness or candela to truly illuminate the room you're in, right? Now, in terms of light, there are a couple terms that you're going to find, um, and one of them is the, the throw of the light, which means the, the intensity of the beam in terms of how it's diffused in the area, right? Uh, a good carry light probably has a pretty wide throw pattern. So I'm not sure if you can see what this light does, but the throw is pretty wide. Okay, so when I illuminate, and this is actually, um, I have several products. I have some stream lights here. I have a couple Phoenix lights, which I haven't had before. I actually uh, was given a few Phoenix lights to test and play with last night. So I'll be playing with this. By the way, this bad boy is extremely bright. Um, and I have a couple other lights. I have a little micro stream here. I have a, an IDPA style kind of light setup that I might use an IDPA, IDPA style stage. Uh, but the point is, if you look at the, the throw of this light, it's a very bright light. You can see the, the, the washout on the wall. And, and I've got a light right here in front of the camera. So this is already, I'm already lit by a light here. So for it to give that much intensity is pretty critical. But if you look at the difference between the throw on the one on the right and the, the, the light quality, right? There's a difference there. Now, better or worse, is there such a thing as better or worse when we're talking about low light products? 
Not really, because what dictates better or worse is going to be dependent on your circumstances. So this one that has a little bit tighter throw, right, in terms of the beam itself and a different kind of light look may be better for a guy that uh, owns property and you're on a farm and you got you got uh, six or seven acres at your yards and your farm and or maybe you're even a bigger area and a ranch. So you, you're searching the ranch yard versus me searching the rooms in my house. Right. So the low light flashlight that you pick is going to be dictated based on that. Now, granted, this is a different size light than this. They're similar in terms of length. But if you look at the width of this, this is one of the things I love about the, the Surefire. I, this is the stiletto. By the way, this is the metal model. They make one of plastic or metal. Opt for the metal one. Spend a little bit more money. Um, and this flashlight, as good as it is, is a little big probably for me to carry full time. Now I only have two of the Phoenix lights. I actually have another Phoenix weapon model light I'll show you here in a second. And I know they make some smaller ones. So I would look for some smaller lights as well. Um, these are both uh, handheld lights that have what we call end cap activation. And that's the second thing I would tell you to look for in a low light system or a low light flashlight, carry type flashlight, is it has to have some sort of button activation. Now, this, this light has an, a secondary activation on the main area, right? So I can turn it to different brightness intensities for utility as a utility light. But if I pull it out of my pocket, I'm doing that. I'm doing a momentary activation of the light with my thumb, right? And I like to be able to activate. I like to be able to strike. I like to be able to cover. I like to be able to do those things. Uh, this one does as well. It has a little kind of a bezel guard that prevents you from having a light AD. But I can activate that light with my thumb. So I can search if I want to very quickly, light on, light off. We always talk about the ability to both turn a light on, right, momentarily, as well as leave it on. So if I click this on, I can turn it on and leave it on for whatever reason. So I want to have a momentary and a permanent on switch as well, okay? Uh, so, let's, man, let's see what we have here on the live stream. Hey, Jared, Jared is on. Nice, Jared from Montana. You have a 1 million candle power for the farm light. Probably, a, yeah, very, very bright light there. Jason, good morning. Jason, Christian, good morning. Morning, Eric. Man, good morning. 2190, good morning, sir. How are you? Nice. Uh, Johanna Mangisto, that's an interesting name. Very nice as well. Nelson is on. Oh, sorry, man. Akeen, hey, good morning. Akeen, just saw you jump on as well. Ryan is on. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Outstanding. Hey, Iowa, Mr. Mike Matina, good morning. So we have a bunch of new people on, folks. We have 70 folks on. For those of you that shared, thank you for the share. We're talking about low light gear. And then we'll do some q and I'm going to show you some weapon mounted lights, and we'll talk about pros and count cons of weapon mounted lights. But for handheld lights, here's, here's what I want. I want you to select one that has at least 200 lumens. By the way, there are almost no flashlights now that the LED bulb is popular or the most popular that don't have at least 200 lumens. I remember back in the day, the old, you know, um, what is it? An incandescent bulb versus the LED bulb, I believe I'm using the right term there. Lights, you know, they had 120 lumens or 100 lumens or whatever else. So we started hitting 150 and 200 lumens. And we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe there's that many lumens. Now, you know, this particular light has 1,200 lumens, right? The other one I have over there has 3,000 lumens on its bright setting. 1,200 lumens, right? So that the amount of intensity some of these lights are throwing is absolutely incredible. So at a minimum, your carry light should have a couple hundred lumens. That's not hard to find these days with all of these lights. This is actually an old carry light that I used to use. It doesn't have a great battery in it. This is a micro stream. This is a... Um, uh, Streamlight MicroStream. They make this in a model where you can put a AAA battery in it. They also make a USB chargeable model where you pop the, the front end of the bezel off here. It just pops out a little bit. And there's a little USB charging slot in there, which is actually pretty darn neat. That's a MicroStream. And this, this kind of brings me to another key point. Um, the, the key point is, you know, whatever flashlight you have, uh, you know, what are they the saying? One is not two is one, one is none. Have a second one, have a backup flashlight, uh, but have one that you'll carry on a regular basis. So if you're in, you know, fancy suit clothes, you know, and in, in, in office type, you know, dress or whatever else, and you don't want to carry a big, meaty looking tactical flashlight that sticks out of your pocket, well, you might very well carry a, a micro stream and have a backup micro stream in your car. 
and maybe even a second micro stream on your on your person. And you can absolutely illuminate. This one has a kind of a dead battery, but you can absolutely illuminate in a dark room enough to illuminate, search for, you know, and do the things that your low light system needs to have. To search, right? To fight, to strike, to defend your head, and to, to shoot if you need to shoot, okay? Um, then when you start to opt up and go to a bigger style light, you know, you may look at something like this, the Surefire, that has a really well-designed light. It's very, very bright. It's designed in a flat manner to fit inside your pocket and, uh, and it's functional as well. And then when we start to get into what I call, you know, for my for my sake, my home defense lights, I'll start to select bigger lights. Like this Phoenix would be a, a probably an appropriate home defense type light. I'm not saying I couldn't carry this, but for me, this is probably a little bit big, uh, bigger than I would put in my pocket. And this, by the way, this is a PD32. Uh, they do make some smaller variants as well. And then, you know, up the chain, we start to get to really big ones. This is the one that has, and this is not charged fully, 3,000 lumens. That is ridiculous. But one of the things that I wanted to show you about this particular light is it has some interesting features. Some of these lights these days, they're making with dual switch um, modules. So what that means is the primary switch allows me to do a momentary light on light off as well as permanent light on if i need to right but there's also a second switch that i can very easily feel that has a strobe function now i'm not a i'm not a huge strober in most cases because the i'm not opposed to strobing don't get me wrong but strobing in dark conditions sometimes can have as much of a negative effect on you as it might your threat but imagine that in your eyes in the darkness if your eyes are just in the darkness you're bumping through the night and you're, you know, you're the bad guy and I'm sneaking around and I finally I realize where you are and I switch to strobe and strobe you. What we want with a low light solution, like that immediate strobing or brightness effect is we want to, we want to put the threat in momentary um, indecisiveness. Like they get flashed with this light and they don't know what to do. They can't react. And that's the advantage of a, of a strobe type feature. Um, I do like the size of these for home defense or vehicle defense lights. Once again, if I'm going to fight with the light, if I'm going to strike with the light, we're talking about some sort of, you know, bezel system that allows me to truly strike. By the way, um, in terms of striking, when people see these bezels, a lot of times they say, well, this is so you can hit a, you know, hit the windshield in a car or a side window in a car and knock it out. That's easier said than done. I've tried it several times. And believe it or not, side windows on most cars are incredibly hard to knock out. But these are great lights for striking because if you notice, they stick outside of my hand. So if I wanted to be able to strike someone or defend my head and throw a counter strike, you know, if the situation wouldn't or didn't work shooting that moment in time, that might be a good light to utilize, okay, in terms of that. All right. Um, let's see what we have as far as folks on. Hey, folks, if you haven't clicked the share button, please do. Brian says his, his department gives him the 4.5 inch and a 7 inch nightstick lights that are reliable. Not perfect, but they're adequate. Absolutely. Good morning, Will Rhodes. I see you jumping on as well. Doug Mays. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Archie Curry. Good morning. Calvary, Alberta. That's nice. Hey, John Shriver from Oklahoma. Good morning. Coin number 1919. Corey Johnson from Knoxville, Tennessee, I believe. Knoxville. Nice to have you, man. Awesome. That's very cool. And Kate, is it Caddy or Katie? Katie. Oh, I think it's Katie from Connecticut. I think you were in my class, right? I think maybe that's awesome. Good morning. All right. Hey, Will Rhodes, number 2269. Put that coin number up there. Simon Coe, man. What's up, Simon? How are you? Good morning. All right. So let's let's talk about a few more things here. So what I want to talk to you real quickly about uh, is the, the actual use of a light on a handgun, right? So we're talking about a weapon mounted light. By the way, I'm not sure if you can see this. This is the Phoenix GL19R, by the way. Um, this is a prototype. This, this guy is not even out until Friday, from what I've been told. They gave it to me last night. Hopefully, it's okay for that if I'm showing off on live stream. This is a Phoenix GLR, uh, GL19R. Um, this guy is a weapon mounted light. It's kind of an interesting light. It's very interesting in terms of its design. What you're going to find is, and let me compare it to, this is a Surefire. This is the uh, X300 Ultra. So that's a really bright, I'm not sure if you could tell that light. These both have 
uh, temporary and full-time on switches, right? So let me let me talk to you about low light solutions for a weapon mono light. Number one, um, those of you that are selecting a weapon mounted light, if possible, and you can find the right model, I would strongly suggest you select a weapon mounted light that offers the ability to put a grip activation switch on the light itself, right? So this is a Streamlight TLR2G. It has a pretty definitive grip activation switch. So you can see when I press that button on the grip, the light activates. What this allows me to do is search and activate the light when I want to, right? So I'm, I'm activating the light with my middle finger. I've been a big proponent of grip activation, activation switches for a long time. Um, I'm not opposed to having a weapon mounted light on a handgun. We'll talk about that in a second, where you don't have a grip activation switch. But for me, a grip activation switch does a lot of things. And let me let me be very specific about this. The grip activation switch allows me to do this, right? So I'm activating the light as I'm extending the handgun. Okay. So you may say, well, Mike, why doesn't this light offer that same ability? And in, in this particular instance, right, because it does not have a grip activation switch, for me to activate the light, if right now in time, I want to shoot, boom, right now, right? To activate the light, I have to reach up with my trigger finger and I have to flip it on and hope that it goes on, right? And for me, you know, this is a, it's, this is a surefire, this is a great light. It's a surefire light, but it's, it's a very stiff switch, right? So I, with my index finger, I can push forward on it to activate it, but I can't shoot because I have to pull the trigger. So the only way for me to shoot with one hand, and that, I think that's the thing that I would point out to you on what. So let me make, let me make sure this is clear because I'm not speaking very clearly. A grip activation switch allows me to go to one hand only. Maybe I had to scoop up my kid, and now as I'm moving out of the house, there's a threat. I build my grip. I fire the gun. Or even with the two-handed grip, I could use it to search the area if I needed to. When I go to shoot, when I build my grip, the light comes on. It's very, uh, you know, non-intuitive, I guess, or maybe that's the wrong word. I don't have to think, turn the light on. I just grip the gun and it comes on. That's the beauty of a grip activation switch. Well, you may say, oh, Mike, what's the downside to a grip activation switch? Well, the downside to a grip activation switch is that if you grip when you don't want to grip, you might have what they call a light AD, right? So if I'm searching and I'm kind of stressed out and I thought I heard a noise, and I actually, boom, bump that light, right? So I squeeze harder than I meant to, mm, well, then I might have a light AD. Now, in most civilian searches in your home or your yard, is that going to be a big deal? Probably not, because moments in time before that, you probably activated the light and did some searching with it. By the way, this one has a light and laser. I'm not sure if you can see the laser. Yeah, you could probably see it on the, on the wall now, on that black. So this has a light and laser combination. I really do like that. Um, this this is a, a safe gun, iron sights, light and laser combination. Uh, I like the ability to, to, to do a light and laser. So there's my spiel for you. If you're going to use a light, right, a weapon mounted light, I strongly suggest you consider one with the grip activated switch. The alternative, and these are both good lights, right, is, you know, this is one of the Phoenixes, right? Show that again. This is a surefire. You're going to have to work on activating the light with your finger. Now, these both of these lights have a different switch. So let me show you this one kind of a close up here. This has a small switch right there where my trigger finger is. And it's a pretty easy switch to push. So when I turn this on, I mean, it's very easy for me to turn this on and off, right? So I could very easy, easily index my finger alongside the light when I'm searching, right? And if I decide I am in a situation where I want to turn that light on, I simply push the finger forward as I'm building my grip. That's very intuitive uh, and fire my shots, right? So if I'm going to shoot, I would push the finger forward. I would fire those shots, right? Push the finger forward, fire those shots. I do like that actually a lot. Um, I would have to test this I just got this Phoenix light last night, by the way. I do have a discount code. I'll post eventually for it. 
Um, but it's a it's a very subtle switch, very easy to activate. Okay, to me that needs to be tested a little bit more. Pros and cons could be maybe the switch fails, but you know this is a well built light. I'm, I'm actually very impressed with these Phoenixes so far. Okay, uh, the Surefire, they're proven, 100% proven. They've been on police officer guns for years and years and years. I can push this light forward, this light switch forward, and activate it. The problem is that's just a momentary feature, right? So the, the, the whole concept of a weapon mounted light is, well, I'm going to activate it with my thumb as I'm building my grip. I'm going to flip that light switch on as I'm building my grip. I have a couple problems with that. The number one problem is for me to take my thumb and reach it up to the switch, this is my normal shooting grip. You all know that I love to clamp the back of the gun. So if I take my thumb and you look at where it is in relation to the switch, it's nowhere near the switch. So for me to get my thumb up here, I have to rotate the palm of my hand off the back of the gun. Now, granted, I have a little bit of a short left thumb. I don't know why. Probably got bit off by the shark. But the point is, you know, your thumb length and where your hand position is doesn't allow the light to be activated very easily, right? Now, you may say, well, Mike, you can activate it with your trigger finger. Yes, I could, but I'm going to want to practice the aspect of activating it very quickly with my trigger finger and firing. And I, I don't have a problem with that. The, the, most of you that have a light in your safe are probably going to be much better off if you grab the light out of your safe. And by the way, if you're in your home, you're going to be much better off just turning lights on if you can. Turn the, turn the light on. Turn the bedroom light on. Turn the, turn the living room light on. If you can do it without backlighting yourself, that means you're standing in the doorway and you, you've turned the light on in the room behind you. That's a bad thing. But if I grab this out of my safe and I'm sleepy and I think there's a bump in the night, I'm just going to turn it on just like that. And I'm going to leave it on and I'm going to search with the light if I need to. You know, and you may say, well, Mike, well, that means you're searching with the muzzle of the handgun. If I've grabbed a handgun in my home in the middle of the night, yes, my handgun is going to be pointed in pretty much every direction I need to. But notice when I'm searching, I'm searching with the muzzle slightly low. So I'm going to wash the light off the ground into the room or whatever I'm in. Now, granted, if I saw a family member, I would go to a position where, okay, now, uh, you know, I'm not pulling the gun out, right? But I am going to utilize the light washing into the room off the ground to search the room. If it's, if it's bad enough where I've grabbed a gun out of my gun safe by my bed and need to search, right, I'm just going to turn the light on. So as I walk into every room, the, the light is lighting up the room and I'm searching. Granted, if there's a family member, I'll muzzle down or I'll avert my muzzle and go from there. I I may turn the light off if I want to stop and listen and look, but generally speaking, the light's going to be on. That's probably the simplest method of searching for most of you that have a weapon amount of light. And folks, I know we'll do some Q&A here in a second. I know I'm I'm talking a lot and, and it seems like there's a lot of stuff to cover. The other, the other way, right, um, is to have a grip activated switch and to train with it. So I might come up in my bedroom in this case, you know, and activate the light and search the room, right? Right. Activate the light and search the room. Activate the light, wash the light off the ground, search the room. And then if I activate the light and there's a threat, boom, I can extend, build my grip because it's a grip activated switch. I could fire my shots. I actually talked to Streamlight about this, but uh, about making a bunch of their micro lights with grip activated switches. And they, they kind of, um, this is at the shot show years ago. They're like, well, that takes an additional amount of training. And that probably is for only for law enforcement or maybe special response teams. I'm like, that's baloney. It's not hard, folks. It's not hard to go, okay, when I need to see, I grip, right? This is a very easy system to activate. And it's also a pretty definitive grip activation system. This is probably one of my, my preferred grip activation switches. Some of the old grip activation switches were not as good, okay? I will tell you, though, for a lot of you that have the ability to look maybe for a little bit more affordable version this is a pretty darn good light. And I really like, I like the aspect of being able to, to activate it by just, you know, doing a, a, maybe doing a search and doing a slight push with your trigger finger forward, boom, boom, boom. I mean, I don't think there's any loss in time, boom, 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 to fire those shots. Right, by the way, speaking of lights, when, when we're talking about lighting up a light or a room, you know, I have an optic on this gun. So one of the things I wanna see is, you know, does the optic, the dot in the optic get washed out by the light? So what you want to do is you want to go in a room like this that has a bright white wall 
turn the optic on and turn your light on and see if you still see the dot. Um, this dot does not get washed out. A lot of people are like, well, your dot's going to get washed out with your light. Even with a one-handed eye index technique, when I do this and shine the light through the window of the optic, I can still see the dot. The dot is daytime bright. So although I would caution shooters to test the light and make sure you can see the dot, um, it, it getting washed out is not very common that I've found. Maybe, you know, if I get this sucker charged up and I'm running on 3,000 lumens, maybe it would wash the dot out, uh, but I haven't found a problem with that. All right, folks. Hey, we're talking about a lot of stuff. I want to talk to you about a technique here in a second a little bit. Who do we have on? We didn't hit 100 this morning, which is kind of interesting. I thought we would. Uh, who do we have on? Katie, Katie, I, tell, I call it Caddy, Katie, that's right, I remember now, Katie, nice to see you on. Alan Kelly says, does weapon mono light interfere with a red dot? No, it does not at all. Uh, matter of fact, uh, well, this has iron sights, so if I take this light, right, and turn it on, Alan, no, it's, it's literally, it's, it really makes things easy. If this is, if you have a full-time truck gun, home defense gun, and a full-time, a quick access safe, you really need to have a, a light on it. But you got to train with it. And that doesn't mean you have to do a bunch of shooting. You don't, you know, you could just grab your own loaded handgun, practice pulling it out of the safe. You know, I have a quick access keypad safe. Uh, and then, you know, come out of your house, right, and search and look around and, Right. To me, there's once the light goes on, there's there's not a big downside. I, I do want to learn, you know, tr turn the light on and, and off. So I, I'm learning this switch as I'm pushing the button. This is a very easy one to push, right? And it's, by the way, this is ambidextrous. Most lights are, right? So I can activate it with the other hand too, okay? So very easy to activate. I actually have found, as much as I like this, the uh, Surefires, this switch is, is, is hard to that's kind of hard for me to push with my left index finger. Maybe I need to get stronger. Um, but it's got a very robust, strong system, too. It's, it's a very robust switch, okay? Uh, Jared, no, I never have my red dot on auto-adjust. Auto-adjust on a red dot, if you have it on auto-adjust, um, then your light, when it illuminates, will, will cause that auto-adjust red dot dot to turn up or down i don't want that i want my red dot on uh they're almost i think i think all the red dots i have are shake awake anyways but they're on manual i don't keep them on auto good morning chris and connor garrity good morning connor how are you mike nelson from payson utah good morning sir how are you scott peters i don't know if i said good morning to you from tampa all right folks um we're talking about low light gear. I talked to you about the, 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 the tenets of selecting a good handheld light. Um, we talked about weapon mounted lights, the difference between a grip activation system, you know, and a thumb or a finger activated system. Uh, I talked to you about the, the, the downside to assuming that you're going to be able to activate your weapon mounted light with your thumb. That's the one I hear the most that is one of my pet peeves. Because number one, it, it causes me to have a different grip on the handgun. I don't, I don't want to do this. I pulled the handgun, the hand away from the back of the gun. Uh, so, so in terms of activating your light, consider there are other options. I might actually, in this case, probably prefer to use my index finger, right, to turn the light on. Um, is it as fast? I think so, right? Versus, I don't know. I don't think there's any difference in speed, but I have to train that. You know, you have to train the aspect of like, hey, I want to extend the handgun and shoot. I got to activate. That switch, like I said, is a little more difficult than this switch, right? Okay. So you want to train with, with either one. I would do about a million bazillion repetitions of this to make sure it worked every single time before I use it on a home defense. But I like what I see so far. This is another option. If you look at the stream light, there's one direction where it goes on full time and the other one where it goes on part time. Now, in this case, if you saw when I go this to the second one, it gives me a strobe effect. For me, to be honest with you folks, 
I when I turn a light on, I could use, by the way, the grip switch on this one, or I could use the finger switch. I like the light to go on and do one thing. So if the light and laser are on, that's what I want it to do. I don't want to have to think through flipping through two buttons and doing different things, you know, and and okay, is it gonna strobe now or is it gonna illuminate? I want it to do one thing, okay? But this this grip switch is a little bit easier to push, right? This has a temporary, but once again, I'm having to rotate. This is the biggest problem I have. I'm having to rotate my hands way far forward to reach it. Look at the gap between my hands. I don't I have a problem with it. This is my number one problem with activating the light with my thumb. And it, it is no doubt because my thumb is just a little shorter than maybe folks, right? But so what? Most people, unless you have really big hands, have to reach forward to get to that switch. I don't like that. I would rather activate with a grip activated switch. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just my personal preference, okay? Um, oh, so Chris, that's a great question. So Chris asks about how do I feel about the, the small light? Let, let's talk about these other positions. By the way, this particular setup is kind of my... IDPA low light stage cheater flashlight, right? So this this is set up. I'll give us give a cert pistol. So on a stage, I can have the light in my hand. I can activate the light, boom, and I can shoot like this, right? So I have a I have a two handed grip. I'm pushing down on the light with my thumb, right? Okay, but this allows me to shoot with a two handed grip. Boom, 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 boom. So you may say, well, Mike, when are you going to shoot with a two-handed grip versus a one-handed grip on an IDPA stage? Only if the shots are very difficult. So I rarely do this um, in terms of – who asked that question? Chris Lewenberg asked that. So the, the, re, the, the you missed part of the discussion maybe, Chris. The reason I don't talk about that a lot is because unless it's competitive use – of the flashlight, I want the flashlight in my hand in a position, boom, where I can strike with it, boom. I could defend my head, right? Defend my head, or I can shoot with it, right? So those are the things that my low light system has to offer. And if my my flashlight is here, right? This is probably not a good striking technique, right? It's not a good defending head technique. It might be an okay shooting technique, right? But I I do have a problem. With, with this search method, right? And the main reason I have a problem is if someone jumped out of the closet, and I said that a, a little bit earlier, right here, and starts swinging a stick in my head or their hand, trying to punch me in the face, for me to defend myself, I have to do this, right? Of course, this is a non-fired cert demonstration tool, so I can, I can show those kind of things because it's not actually a firearm. But the point is, you know, to, to, to throw a strike or defend my head, I'm covering my own body. I don't like my hands tied up. That, there's something I want you to remember. If you're using a low light technique that has your hands tied up or really tied up in a manner, and that's another problem, drop the magazine up. This is an issue for me. I can't, I can't throw a strike. I can't defend my head. I want to be able to search, check my gun, right? Boom, throw a strike, defend my head, and I want to be able to shoot. Uh, shoot. So that's that's my preference in terms of low light for defensive use, right? Not not necessarily for competitive use. For competitive use, I will shoot with this one-handed position, but I will also shoot with a two-handed position, utilizing a light like this between my fingers, but only when the shots are very very difficult. Okay. Cloud defensive pistol light that will be released sometime this decade. Uh, Joe, I'm not sure what you're talking about, man. So please uh, let me know that. Yeah, Chris. For IDPA, that's my technique of choice, right? Uh, I do it between my first and second finger. When I activate the light and build my grip, I'm grabbing the light, I'll show you in the camera, and I'm building my grip, and I'm actually pressing my thumb on top of the light because I want the light pointed as much forward as possible versus down. I don't want the light down. I want the light forward. And, but that also allows me to reach down Manipulate my vest, do a reload, right? All the different things that I do. And that's my full two-handed low light grip, okay, for IDPA. But, you know, a lot of times with IDPA, I'll look at a stage and I'll determine, hey, how, you know, if they're pretty much wide open. 
or you maybe they set up the stage with some walls and a little structure. I will probably default to my one headed technique. So I'll have the light on, I'll draw and I'll just boom, 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 boom. I'll just shoot with one hand, right? And I'm comfortable with my, you know, with my one hand shooting technique. Uh, Scott Peters, muzzle strike. Yes, muzzle strike. I, I think muzzle striking is awesome. It's cool. But you have to be more specific by your question. I'm not sure what you mean. So please give me a few more details, Scott, so I can answer your question as well. Oh, Brian asks, how do I feel about red light versus white light? Um, here's the deal. The, you know, the red light is just not going to be as bright. Um, it's better for your night vision. You know, back in the day, we'd put a red lens on our flashlights to read maps because you didn't lose your night vision. But when we're talking about IDPA, civilian defensive shootings, searching your home or your yard, it's going to be a white light because white light is very bright. Red light is not going to be very bright. And uh, training session, you were warned against leaving the light on. Yeah, so Brian also asked, is it bad to leave your light on? Yeah, So, but here's the deal. I will tell you, let me give you a great example. Let's say I have a bump in the night, and I'm, I'm, I wake up, and I roll over, I open my safe, I grab my weapon-mounted full-time defensive home defense handgun with a light, and I'm like, I think there's someone in the living room. I, I don't have a lot of time to sneak around, do the whole snoop and poop thing. I'm not going to be like, Right, where's he at? I'm, I'm not saying I would never do that, but in generally, there's someone in my living room. I don't know if they're going to go upstairs to my kids' room that's up there or my other kids' rooms that are right over here. So I'm grabbing the, the gun with the light. I'm probably coming out of the bedroom. I'm probably going to activate the light and I'm going to be utilizing the light to light that room up as brightly as possible. Once I light the room up, here's the thing I want you to think about. A lot of people are like, if you leave the light on, you're a target. Well, guess what? Once you leave the, once you turn the light on in that room, everybody knows where everybody else is anyways. There's really no hiding. So if I could take the light and do that to the threat, did you notice that that totally shut the camera down? It's going to do the same thing to your vision, right? That's what I want. So when I come into that room, I want that light in their eyes. And then that moment in time, I'll have made the decision, oh, that's my teenager, right? Or that's a dude in my house with a knife that's going to try to harm my family. And then I'll go from there. So I'm not that worried about having the light on. I'm not saying I wouldn't enter the, my living room area or whatever and go, whoa, there's nobody in here. Let me turn the light off and listen for a second. Okay. What do I hear? Wait, I think there's someone in the other room. Let me, let me enter this next room. You know, there they are. Does that make sense? The search, the search technical aspects of light stuff is really interesting to play with a little bit okay oh scott talks about uh, muzzle strikes as an option in close contact absolutely 100 percent. i talk about muzzle strikes all of the time for close range shooting position right boom muzzle striking with a two-headed grip and some of you watching this or and, and listening to scott's comment may say well mike why would we muzzle strike versus shoot maybe you're too close you don't have the time to shoot uh, maybe you're not positive who it is. Once again, I have had several teenagers sneak into my house in the middle of the night, and I didn't have the ability to shoot them because they were my teenagers. One was not my teenager, was a friend of one of the teenagers. But the point is, just the shoot solution, the always shoot solution is is not viable. Even if for some of you are in the you know, the thick of things somewhere downrange, you know, you might have to visually warrant shooting to make sure it's not a teammate or your partner or teammate is not in the way of the muzzle. So a muzzle strike, whether it's a single-handed muzzle strike or a two-handed muzzle strike is absolutely a viable technique, um, Scott. I, I love muzzle striking, right? And maybe a muzzle strike, boom, with the light, <laughs> that even makes maybe more, more sense, okay? Yeah, so Brian talked about the micro lights, and they might be a little harder. So there are trade-offs to every light size. You know, this light might be easier to carry than this light or this light, right? This light is not going to give me nearly as much striking surface as this light, right? 
it's not going to give me the lumens that this light does. So absolutely, you know, there are pros and cons and trade-offs to every light piece of gear that you might select. I totally agree with that. Uh, and you have to select the best light for your low light system and your circumstances. And keep in mind, folks, where, you know, you might see a smaller light in my pocket as my full-time carry light. You will definitely see a much bigger or robust flashlight, right, around my home as my home defense light or my vehicle defense light that I'm going to grab and use. Man, I could, I could do some whacking with this light. A whack-a-mole, right? Okay. Um, Gab Leo says shooting is the last choice. Yes, it probably is in most most cases. Okay. Yeah, Pat, I completely agree, folks. If you didn't read Pat's uh, comment, he, Pat Kale says not everyone should leave their defensive perp, uh, position and search their home. For some people, maybe perfect to stay put. Uh, I would mirror that, Pat. M more importantly, I would say for a large majority of you, you're much better. A hunkering down in a safe area with in a good defensive position and searching your home. I have I've never said, nor in this discussion, that you should go search. But I would tell you if I grabbed the gun out of the weapon out of safe and I heard my front door get kicked in, and I have three other kids in this house, I'm leaving my bedroom and going to the kids. Right? Uh, that's right for me, maybe not right for a lot of you couple that is alone in your home, has a great bedroom, secure door, you lock it at night before you go to bed, man, hunker down in there in a good position to wait for someone else to come through that door. I completely agree with that. I think it's a great point. Will Parker says he carries two lights. That's that's awesome. I think well, two is one, one is none, right? That's cool saying. I completely agree with that. Um. Gilly, yeah, we talked about that earlier a little bit, if, if you if you miss that. So here's the deal. So the folks that say weapon mounted light is awesome, but I don't like to search with a weapon mounted light because the, the muzzle is pointed in that direction. Um, do I have a problem with folks searching with a handheld light and having a weapon mounted light on the gun? I don't have a problem with that. But I will tell you that in most cases, if you've got your gun out, right? You have to trust yourself and hopefully have trained enough to know where my muzzle direction is and how to avert my muzzle direction and utilize this light. For example, I'll wash the light into the room, wash the light into the room, wash it, wash it, right? So I'm using my muzzle. The, the, the downside to switch into this, right, is now I've taken a really good tool a weapon amount of light, and I've kind of negated it. In this case, I probably don't actually need the weapon amount of light on the handgun. So if I have a weapon amount of light and I'm in a, a, a high intensity or high stress environment, searching my home where I really think there's an intruder in my home, I'm going to turn the light on and I'm going to recognize that I'm going to use great trigger finger position, right? And I'm going to use good muzzle discipline. And I might, as I'm searching, if I'm coming around a corner, that muzzle might be in the direction of a family member's room or whatever else. And I'm not telling you you should do that, but I'm telling you that might be the case in, in, in the use of a weapon mounted light in a high stress circumstance. The other alternative would be to not have the weapon mounted light at all and just to do your handheld searching and then shoot the gun when you need to shoot the gun. But for most of you, almost everybody listening or watching this, that's not as good with one hand as you are with two hands. Understand, this is a much better position to shoot from for most of you. I mean, it's it's literally, it's like cheating. It's, 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 it's not that hard. The shooting is going to be exactly the same, you know, as it would be if you were on the range in the daylight. So there are pros and cons to weapon-mounted lights. And I know everybody tries to say, hey, well, if the muzzle, yeah, okay, well, so what? If you're searching your home with a handheld light, guess what? Your muzzle's probably pointed in the direction you are. And if, you're, if your kid walked around the corner right now, your muzzle's still in that direction. But now I have two hands doing two different things, right? Um, this, you know, the advantage here is I can search, right? I, I can defend, I can strike, you know, I can do a lot of different things with a, a weapon amount of light. There's not a really perfect answer or a right answer. You gotta train with both and check, 
you know, try both and see what one works out for you. Okay. So Jeff says your pocket light streamlight stylus. I don't actually think I have a stylus. I'm not sure if I do or not. Um, interesting. I haven't seen the stylus. Might be a great light. Sure. Holding the light of the hand, keeping the side of your head. Yeah, that's a good technique. Okay. All right, folks. Let me see if I have any other questions. I don't see any other questions. This is actually a really great session. We didn't have a ton of viewers on, maybe. Uh, maybe a little light is not that important, but I think there's some good content here and some things hopefully that I answer for you. Um, so Chad says, most folks, yeah, don't train one-headed shooting office, so weapon amount of light is optimal. Listen, folks, the, the weapon amount of light solution is, is really viable. Like I said, I, I if I were to give you my end preference, I would probably choose the weapon amount of light with a grip activation system, right? Right. But you, you got to practice with that. You know, I practice, make sure I can activate it with one hand, make sure I can activate it with the other hand. Can I activate it with two hands? Right. Of course, I can do all these things. I don't want to be in a situation where I'm like, I'm trying to activate this light and it's not working. In that case, simplify. Grab a light, pull it out of your safe, turn it on. Right. Search. Right. So everywhere you look is illuminated. So if you decide to shoot, you just have to point the handgun and shoot. That's, there's no thought to it once the light goes on. And make sure if you select that, right, in this case, I could activate the light with my support hand, activa activate the light with my strong hand. So there's there's some thoughts for you. And Tony, is there such a thing as too bright? I think there is too bright. Some of the lights these days, I mean, we're talking about, this one is not an example of too bright, but this in a white washed out room in pure darkness, many more lumens in this, you know, in a room in a house, that initial washback actually can affect your night vision. Um, but it depends, you know, when you're selecting a light, do, you know, am I searching the home where I, I probably would prefer a little bit more of, of a throw pattern. So when I pop the light on in a room, the whole room looks like it's lit versus a very intense beam. I'm a fan of a big throw for house and room distances. I'm a fan with a more concentrated beam. You know, I'm a fan of that for bigger yards, ranch yards, uh, properties, you know, like uh, Will Parker's in Montana is a huge range and he goes out in his yard. He needs to be able to illuminate maybe a hundred yards plus. That's going to take a different light than a room light. So, you know, when we talk about lights, we can't just say, hey, one light is the best. The other light is not the best. It really depends on your circumstance. And I would select the light based on your circumstance. OK. So Victor asks about the strobe light. Can a strobe light be used in those low light settings? Yes, Victor. I showed this one earlier. This one has a momentary and permanent on feature but it also has a strobing effect. The first strobe effect lights that I had found with a different switch like this um, were actually made by a company called Nightcore. I don't know if they're still around, but the cool thing about the Nightcore is I don't need to look at it. I can feel which switch I'm on. Momentary, strobe, right? So if I want to strobe someone, I could just use that strobe function. Be careful with strobing though. In a very low light situ situation where your eyes are you know, acclimated to darkness and you get into a bright room like a washed out wall and, or you go to strobe someone, if that strobe washes back in your eyes, it can have the same effect on you. So just be aware of that. I'm more of a fan of just bright, intense light, right? Where it shuts, shuts their vision down for a second and goes from there. I'm not opposed to strobing, but I'm more of a fan of just bright. bright. Uh, Sandra, you missed a rewind the video. Go back to the beginning. We talk about lumens. There are no number of lumens that are best uh carry light should have a minimum a minimum of a couple hundred lumens but today with leds all lights have a couple hundred lumens you know every one of these little lights has a couple hundred lumens and that's going to light up everything you need to most of them have more than 500 lumens if not 12 if they're recording the you know the lumens accurately okay all right folks 
Let me see if I have any other questions. I don't have any other questions. All right, if you have any other low light questions, let me know. Hey, next week, here's what I want to talk about. We're going to talk real briefly about handheld lights again. Uh, and next week, I'm going to break down the pros and cons of one-handed technical positions, like shooting with one hand, right? Shooting and searching, how we maintain, striking, how, to, how, how I might integrate longer range positions to close range positions, to extreme close range positions, how I may defend my head, my considerations on searching and striking. So we're going to talk about all the technical aspects of the one-handed eye index technique. The, the instances where maybe I would utilize this technique, right? There's a specific one I have in mind. Uh, why, generally speaking, I probably wouldn't search with a two-handed tied together technique. So we're going to talk about all of the technical aspects of, you know, weapon weapon light use or light low light use with a you know a single handed position, you know, also the position of the light in your hand so you can still manipulate the slide and do all the things you need to do aside from search. So let's talk about all that stuff next week, folks, on Thursday morning, and uh, hopefully uh, answer some more questions. Okay. Um, I don't see a ton more questions. Um, Lumens versus Candela. That's a great question, Tony. And I have an incredible PowerPoint I should pop up there and show you. Uh, but here's what I, I found that for me, I focus on two things instead of getting into the complicated terms of Lumens versus Candela. I look at two things. Brightness, the total brightness, which is normally dictated on the low on the flashlight package by lumens uh we can talk about candela later on and throw the throw is the thing that most people forget to talk about because uh one light that is reported to be let's say 2000 lumens has a very tight throw pattern right and that's measured differently than a, another light that has a very wide throw pattern i really a fan in rooms of a wider throw pattern versus a tighter pattern that lights up a spot on the wall or whatever else and gives that uh, almost the washback or the that kind of that effect of like if you look at the sun real quickly and you kind of see that little sun in your in your eyes. I don't like that. I like the ability to illuminate and, and look, if you look at the throw on that one, it's different. This would be a better yard light. Big room light, this is going to be a better generally illuminate the area light, right? I want to pop the light on and illuminate. So I'm, I'm a fan of focusing on the total lumens and the throw of the light versus the technical details between the candela and lumens. We'll talk about that in the next live stream as well. Um, Jacob, I'm not sure what that means. How to fix faults with lamp in hand. You have to give me more de details on that later on. I don't know what you're talking about there, sir. I'm sorry. All right, folks, that's all I have. I don't see any other questions popping up. Thank you so much. I have 8.30. Uh, next week, Thursday morning, we're going to work on the technical stuff. So bring your, bring your unloaded handgun, bring your handheld light, and I'm going to teach you the one-handed eye index technique. We're going to talk about manipulations with that one-handed technique. We're going to talk about striking and fighting in close quarter positions and everything else. So there you go, folks. Next week, see you there, 7.30 a.m. Thursday morning. Be there or be square. And until then, trade hard.